There is a supplement out there that is touted to improve both bone health and hormone levels in both peri and postmenopausal women. Some claim that it will restore hormones like HRT. Some say it's a substitute for HRT, but without the risk. I wanted to get into this supplement today. And what I'm talking about is maca. I want to talk about maca, the research supporting it, and where I do find it to be clinically useful, but where we really need to be careful in interpreting the research if we're considering that our primary goal is bone optimization and hormone optimization. I don't think we can lean on this in the way that some experts in this space are recommending that we do based on the literature that's available. If you're using maca and you're having a good experience or a bad experience, I'd love to hear about it. Leave us a story in YouTube. So I'm gonna show you exactly how we talk about maca in our practice, but before I do, let's start with some basics. What is maca? So maca is scientifically known as, and I'm not gonna say this right, but let's call it Lepidium myenii, something like that. It's a root vegetable that grows high in the mountains in Peru. It's been cultivated for over 2000 years. It's referred to as all kinds of things, but Peruvian ginseng, it's called an adaptogen. It's known to be like a cruciferous vegetable, like broccoli and cauliflower, but it thrives in a high, harsh altitude environment. So these dry kind of rough, rough environments. When you pull maca out of the ground, it kind of looks like a turnip, uh, or like a big turnip. And you can either dry it or you can ground it into powder. You can prepare it into extracts. You can do all these kind of things. But here's the thing. Maca, like other roots, are really going to vary from kind of like subspecies or area to area. Different colored roots are going to have different impact. And so not all maca is the same. And this really matters. So not only are not all maca the same, actually... There are two totally different plants. So the one I mentioned above is the traditional one, but actually most of the, the harvested maca is from this plant called Lepidium peruvianium, if I said that right. So that's the one that is more likely to be grown for harvesting or, or grown in large quantities. Um, but again, it even comes in different colors and the different colors are gonna have different properties. So major point number one here is not all maca is the same. So choosing the right product really matters. So we'll get to what our favorite product is, but before we get there, let's talk about what people claim about these things. So I mentioned they're kind of used all over the place, but these claims include that these roots, when they're consumed, are rich in nutrients. They enhance energy and stamina and endurance. Hormone balance, like I said, they are claimed to relieve menopausal symptoms, perimenopausal symptoms, PMDD symptom relief, improving mood, mental, sexual function, fertility, and bone health. So that's a lot of things. So how is it that it could do all these things? Well, so its primary mode of action, or at least what we see, is that it can increase estrogen, which is cool. But unlike using something like soy or a phytoestrogen like genistein, it doesn't work on the estrogen receptor. It actually works in the brain, in the hypothalamus, and it helps then to increase the messaging from the hypothalamus to the pituitary, which then would tell the ovaries to make more estrogen. So it almost works more like the drugs for infertility, the clomid, clomiphene drugs in men, where it tells the brain to tell the, the testicles to make more testosterone. We're kind of doing the same thing, but we're using an adaptogen to tell the brain to tell the ovaries to make more estrogen, if that makes sense. The exact mechanism is not clear, but it doesn't act on the estrogen receptors. That much is clear. So I looked up a bunch of different studies on maca, and like most herbs or natural products, we see a number of studies that are you know, very small in number, not clear on what kind of product they're using. But there's one specific study I want to talk about here, which is a study that was done on the, the product Maca Go. So Maca Go is sold, I'll tell you uh, where to get it, but it's sold in a couple of different actual end products, consumer products. But Maca Go is a proprietary product that uses a very specific version of Maca. What I like about this product is that it's using the same product, you have the same the same strain, the same color, we know exactly what this thing is, so it cuts out a lot of the potential variation from other maca plants. So in this study, this was not a large randomized control trial, but in 34 individuals, there were 22 in a crossover configuration and 12 that were in a specific pilot bone density study. So this is cool, right? Now they tested a whole lot of stuff, and I'm not gonna go through all of that either, but the major points are that they showed, and this is consistent in all the studies, they show that you can increase estrogen levels in a perimenopausal and early postmenopausal woman. So therefore, you can imagine it's going to have a potential benefit on symptoms of menopause. The question is, did it change the bone mineral density? Did it protect the bone mineral density? Because ultimately that's what I wanna know. 
So while they did show that you can increase estrogen significantly, in fact, in some, in some of the participants, it was either up by 50% or up by 100%, which is pretty amazing. They did measure bone mineral density, but again, this is only a four month long trial. So in four months, even with a powerful tool, like even with a pharmacological tool poisoning osteoclast, you're not gonna see much change in four months. You're just not gonna see change in bone mineral density that quickly. So I wish they would have done this study for longer and on more individuals. So unfortunately for the 12 individuals in the study, we can't say that it was either protective or that there was any growth of bone. There may have been a trend in that direction, but it just wasn't big enough. I'm gonna talk about exactly how we're recommending this now because we do, but we have to do it for the right person and the right circumstances. But before I get there, if you're having a hard time putting together your own bone health program and you're wondering how to string all these things together, if you haven't joined our masterclass, please do so. Totally free opportunity to hear me walk through how we put together a customized bone health program. Then we leave about 15 minutes for Q&A. Totally free. If you're on YouTube, look for the link in the description. If you're on a podcast listening to this, then join us on optimalhumanhealth.com online and you can register right there. So the research is pretty cool. I like that they have this very specific product. I like that they show that you can increase estrogen, but we didn't show an improvement in bone mineral density. However, I'll say this. One trial does not close the door on this being an option. We just need to see more trials. We need to see bigger trials. We need to see longer trials because I wanna see at the levels that they can push up estrogen to, I would expect to see benefit for bone. However, what I hear the recommendation for for this product is if you're a postmenopausal woman, use this to relieve your symptoms and protect your bone. My concern here is that even though we can show in this study at four months, you see this, in, this rise in estrogen, but then you start to see it fall. Now that fall was not significant and maybe it was just a natural variation. But my concern is this, menopause is ovarian failure, meaning that your ovaries are not going to continue to make estrogen. If we are telling your brain to tell your ovaries to make estrogen and your ovaries aren't gonna make estrogen, then we're going to eventually see this fail, right? And so part of my clinical question is, how, what's this look like over time? If we're trying to whip the ovaries, which are tired and they're not working anymore to make more estrogen, could they work for a few months and then give out? The brain is already telling the ovaries to make more estrogen in the early postmenopausal state. That's why we measure LH and FSH and they're through the roof. So maca is apparently able to drive it through another pathway, which is fine, but how long can that last? Because again, the ovaries are already in failure. So my concern is if you're gonna lean on this as a tool to drive up estrogen levels, help with your symptoms of menopause and improve your bone, are you actually gonna see long-term relief? And we don't have, we don't have you know, 12 month data to look at that. So I also worry that if this was done in an early postmenopause group, like let's call it you know, like a group of 52 year olds or 55 year olds, where they're in those first five years, maybe there is some potential there that we wouldn't see for a group of 55 or 60 year olds or 65 year olds or 70 year olds. So again, we just need to be careful when we're using this, potentially even consider doing the biomarker testing. Let's test our estradiol and make sure that we're actually seeing what we think we're seeing when, when it comes to estrogen. I think the reason why people do wanna use this though is that they're afraid of estrogen. Now there are certainly some women who are not candidates for estrogen and maybe this is a way to get around that, but I see this sort of like I see the idea of using phytoestrogens instead of estrogen. If you're gonna work on the estrogen receptors but not use estrogen, does that really decrease your risk? I see the same issue with my colleagues who wanna use testosterone alone to say, oh, well, I don't wanna give estrogen, it's risky. I'm gonna give testosterone and it's gonna to convert to estrogen and then I don't have the risk. Well, that doesn't make sense either, right? So either you have estrogen or you don't. Either you are manipulating the receptors like with a genistein or with soy or you're not. So. From my perspective, if a woman is a candidate for estrogen and wants to use estrogen, then we should use estrogen. We shouldn't use an alternative to estrogen to reduce the risk. I think either we're going to use it or we're not. We're gonna have the risk or we're not. Now, if a woman's not a candidate for estrogen, then the question is, what else could we use to help relieve her symptoms, avoiding the risk of whatever it is that that woman is at risk for? If it's a recurrence of breast cancer, if it's some other thing that we're worried about with estrogen that we don't necessarily need to be worried about if we're using another pathway. 
but using maca, which increases estrogen, is not a replacement for estrogen. I hope that makes sense. So where do we use maca then? So I'm not using it in the postmenopausal population, but I am open to using it in a premenopausal population, especially women that have significant symptoms around her period. So if you have symptoms in that week or potentially 10 days leading up to menstruation, if it's the rise in progesterone and you're struggling from an estrogen perspective, this could potentially bump up your estrogen a little bit and give you a little bit of balance. It's something to consider. Also, for women that are in the perimenopause cycle who are seeing fluctuations in estrogen, maybe they're not getting the spike, you know, days 10, 12, 14 that they're used to, they're not having enough estrogen in their system, maca can help to drive that up, right? So then you're going to see some potential benefit, potentially even using it part of the cycle, although most people will use it continuously through the cycle and continue to see benefit and relief of symptoms there as well. So lastly, when it comes to products, the product that I am recommending for our patients that's available on full script is a product called Feminescence. So Feminescence uses the proprietary Maca Go. I have no financial relationship. I have no code to offer you, but this is the product that I've been recommending for our patients. So I wanted to pass that along to you. If you are looking for a discount, you could consider joining our HealthSpan Nation. HealthSpan Nation is a monthly membership where you meet with me once a week or one of my team members. We have a, a topic-driven Q&A and we could talk about things like supplements and hormones and all the things, osteoporosis and women's hormone health. So we do that once a week and then there's a fantastic community that asks each other questions and helps uh, you know elevate each other up. Uh, and then you get discounts to our full script. So that's why I bring this up is that you could potentially get discounts to products like Feminescence and, and many other things that we recommend for osteoporosis through our own dispensary on full script. So that's an option that you could consider as well. If you wanna sign up for that, just go to our website, optimallyhumanhealth.com and you can see a link for that there. So this was a review of maca. And if you like this, you could consider this review of genistein. I mentioned that earlier, a phytoestrogen. And then also look at this video on the risks of estrogen itself, because this is sort of the central component of why people are using things like genistein and maca. So that's it. Remember that a diagnosis of osteoporosis is not the end, but deciding to reverse it is a beginning. I'll see you in the next video.